On behalf of our festival co-directors, Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library, and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to this session of JLF Colorado 2020 Virtual Festival. Our next session is The Writing Room, The Gurus of Crime, Hussain Zaidi and Vikram Chandra in conversation with Jenny Bhatt. Introducing us to the inner world of noir, Celebrated authors Vikram Chandra and Hussain Zaidi embark on a journey around the various aspects of the genre, the craft and techniques of building plot and character and developing narrative styles. In conversation with writer and literary critic Jenny Bhatt, they present a masterclass on fiction and the dark side. Hussain Zaidi is one of India's leading crime writers and has written several best-selling books, including The Class of 83, Dongri to Dubai, Six Decades of the Mumbai Mafia, Mafia Queens of Mumbai, Black Friday, and my name is Abu Salam. A veteran of investigative crime and terror reporting in the media, he's worked for the Asian Age, Mumbai Mirror, Midday, and Indian Express. He's also the associate producer for the HBO movie Terror in Mumbai, based on the 2611 terror strikes. Vikram Chandra is the author of Geek Sublime, Sacred Games, Love and Longing in Bombay, Red Earth and Pouring Rain. He's a co-founder of Granthika Co, a startup reinventing writing for the digital age. He teaches creative writing at the University of California. Jenny Bhatt is a writer, literary translator, and book critic. She's also the host of the Desi Books podcast. Her sto short story collection, Each of Us Killers, was out in September 2020, and her Gujarati to English translation, Ratno Dholi, Dhumketu's Best Short Stories, was released in October 2020. Her writing has appeared in venues like NPR, the Washington Post, The Atlantic, BBC Culture, Long Reads, Literary Hubs, Kroll.in, and many more. Our podcast partner for this session is Lonchora. Do follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. We request you all to please donate to help keep JLF Colorado a free festival and to ensure the continuous flow of knowledge and information. We now present The Writing Room, The Gurus of Crime, Hussain Zaidi and Vikram Chandra in conversation with Jenny Bhatt. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Kritika. And um, thank you, Vikram and um, Hussain, to, you know, for this session, for joining us here. Um, when I found out I was going to be talking with both of you, I was very excited because I've actually read your, all your books, except for Geek Sublime. I have read all the other books and I've actually even written about a couple of them. So i um, very happy to have this conversation. And since we're talking more about the um, craft, I thought rather than asking you the usual questions, which I know you get asked at a lot of places about your movie and film and TV adaptations, I wanted to focus today more on the actual writing craft of crime and noir. And, you know, I, I actually attended one of your Facebook live sessions, which was last weekend, where I think we talked about, both of you talked about plot and character. And it got me thinking, um, when we talk about plot in crime or noir uh, genre, a very important element, which is also an important element in both your books, when it comes to plot, is time. How time is used. And I'm thinking specifically, for example, of how, you know, in Vikram's book, Sacred Games, you've got that countdown of the number of days and what's happening. And then also with, um, you know, Black Friday, for example, you've got this countdown. And so time becomes a very important element uh, when it comes to crime and noir. And in, I think just in general across the genre. And I wondered if you could both maybe speak a little bit about how you view time as a um, important element of plot and how you've approached it both in your fiction and then some, maybe some examples of where you've seen time being used very well um, that you could share with us. Hussain, I go first? Well, I mean, I think obviously, um, sorry, go ahead. No, I think you should start <laughs> first. I'll, I'll follow up later. Okay. Okay, so what I was going to say was that that um, 
I think in all kinds of writing, but especially as we were saying in crime fiction in general, um, uh, there's often a timer put on events, right? And and in major ways, like the, the the device often of the disaster that's going to happen, unless the protagonists uh, somehow manage to stop it, right? But even in smaller segments, right? There's always the um, so and so is getting on a boat to escape to uh, you know uh, Zambia in like five minutes, and so you better have to get there. So I think the the most obvious thing that people do is deploy time as a means of generating suspense. Mm -hmm. But also I think in both Hussein and I, in the work that we do, there's also al always a lot of backstory, right? Like uh, the, the present of any character, but especially in this kind of fiction is rooted in history. Um, and so what I find very useful is jumping back and forth, obviously that, that's what I end up doing. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of, uh, you can make the past present, uh, you can make the past appear in the present through that kind of thing. And again, this is not, this is very common, right? The use of flashbacks of memory uh, to illuminate something. Mm -hmm. What's that? Uh, now I find uh, that using this element of time is different in fiction and it's absolutely different in nonfiction. Now I was initially writing a lot of nonfiction books. So I realized that I had to have follow a linear flow of the stories. And sometimes the non-linear might be confusing for the readers. For example, I can't be writing something about now 2020 and tell them what happened 10 years earlier. So the biggest restricting factor for me in non-fiction was that I have to follow the linear thing, which in fiction, as we have all the flexibility and, and we are more free in a way, we have to tell a story in the craft that we have to use the narrative arc. It is very easy to use flashback or you can, you know, kind of go back. So we use it differently in both the thing, as in, in nonfiction, I'm trying to be always linear and in fiction, I'm trying to be non-linear. I can change the time and we, I can play around with the factor where how to use the time. And uh, I realized that it is much more enjoyable when we are using the uh, non-linear format, because these days we see even Hollywood has been using a lot of non-linear mode, even in Bollywood has been using a lot of non-linear storytelling technique. But however, for the sake of convenience and for the sake of understanding the reader, I think in non-fiction, I will always stick to being linear and you know having a chronological sequence of the order. Well, that, and that's a very good point. I hadn't, because I'm also mostly a fiction writer other than my book review stuff. So I hadn't thought about what you just said that with, with non-fiction, you try to keep the chronology versus yeah. with um, fiction, that makes sense. And I think coming back to what you said just there, Vikram, is you know time as an element to create suspense, but also then time uh, with the back and forth in the narrative to give backstory. And I found that a lot in, in Sacred Games, for example, where, where we were getting a lot of Sertaj Singh's backstory or even Gaitonde's. And I thought, I remember reading that and I thought there's, there's, there's a trick here that you know, when I say trick, it's not a trick. What I mean is there's a skill here in knowing how much and how often to go back and forth. And I think that that's in both of your cases, with both your fictions. I think it's important, even with, for example, Mafia Queens of Mumbai, um, where, you know, you did, you know, go back and forth, is that? because when you're telling us the story of one of the characters, you're going back into their, potentially their childhood or their life-defining moment to then shed light on why they are where they are today. And so there is this balance, right, of knowing when to set your present time from where to tell the story. How do you decide that? How do you decide so, where so that present you, time is? So yeah, so since you give an example of the Mafia Queens of Mumbai, that was quite an experimental book that I've done. You will hmm. see that it has a, a compilation of 13 profiles of different women. And in one of the stories, uh, Vikram appears, you know, as a candy yeah. character in there. Right, we right. both are chasing that mafia queen and her right. boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Now, in that story, you will see that uh, I have gone back only with the help of this storytelling technique of her boyfriend, Ustra, Hussain Ustra, mm -hmm. who actually trained this girl, Sapna Didi, in becoming a killing machine. Mm -hmm. So how the whole story was based only the way he was narrating. And that's how the whole story unfolded. So... Mm -hmm. I have a confession to make. I had no other way to go back in the past and narrate the story if Ustra would not have narrated it. 
So uh, this is one handicap that I felt there, but then somehow we tried to camouflage the whole handicap with a beautiful storytelling and uh, somehow Sapna, these characters are so engrossing that nobody noticed this, you know, handicap in the story that there's only one character who's narrating the whole story and that's how they can see the whole story in front of them. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you often do that, right? So you all, you know, the the sort of very common scene in a detective story, for instance, right, where they find the the detective finds a protagonist, uh, uh, an informer in some back alley, and he's roughing him up, and then yeah. the guy spills it, right? Yeah, so yeah. what that is is a it's a very obvious trick, right? <laughs> because you you go on to do exposition, but you have to dress it up in drama, right? So the reader mm-hmm. doesn't know that they they're getting an information dump, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The same thing happens in like cop stations, right? That that uh, interrogation room thing. Um, so people do this all the time. Yeah, it's, right, it's, right. And then, I mean, at least for me, um, uh, you st- or everyone, I think you you want to start at a dramatic moment, right? Where yeah. the conflict, in a sense, is already rolling, right? Mm-hmm. And then you do the backstory. And this is an ancient principle, right? Start in right. the middle and don't don't worry about the backstory. It'll come later. Right. Yeah. In Medea's rest. Yeah. I, I had. That's a, what I, Vikram taught me. I learned this principle from Vikram while doing Black Friday, and uh-huh. I don't know whether he has noticed or not. But since Black Friday, I've used this in all of my books. You know, <laughs> smart ways of people cannot notice, but I learned this from him actually. Right. Right. Well, that, that that's great. And I, you know, obviously that's one of the things I've learned in my writing workshops as well. Um, but I did have one instructor give me one piece of advice, which I love. You know, it's about start in Medea's rest for sure. But it's even more interesting if you start at the point of no return, which is your hero or your protagonist has said or done something that they can't take back. Yeah, and yeah. now what? Right? Now what? They've, they've done. I mean, yes, you're starting in the middle of action, but now they've said or done something. And I mean, that just sets everything loose. And I can't say that I'm as skilled um, to get to that every time. But I do keep that in the back of my head when I'm trying to write a you know, conflicted opening. So that's that's great to know. Yeah. Um, well, also, so, I just wanted to say about time, and yeah. especially when you're dealing with history, it I have to say it gets hard to do, mm-hmm. right? Because because if you, even when I'm writing fiction and I'm placing it against the background of history, against real events, the events have to line up, right? Mm. Uh, so that, you know, Sartaj is the first responder on um, bombing in Bombay in a certain year, that mm-hmm. means he's this old, right? He can't have left high school. So mm-hmm. when they, one of the first major decisions that had to be made when uh, the book Sacred Games was being made over into uh, into a, a TV series was like, do we set do the, do we do this as a period piece, or does mm-hmm. does it come, you know, to the late two thousands? And then once the decision was made um, to bring it to twenty eighteen everything changed, right? All the ages mm-hmm. changed. And I remember going into the writer's room at, in Bombay and on a big blackboard, they had all the characters and their birthdays and ages written, right? Oh my because gosh, Because yeah. everything had to be brought forward and everything gets messed up, right? Right, right. Uh, so so it is a, it's not an easy problem when you're writing fiction, especially. And often, you know, if you change one date even, um, you know, you move one event forward, then all the connected events in the past and in the um, in the future have to adjust as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, b- because you've got multiple characters and you've got these historical events, you can't get those details wrong. So totally, yeah. So so let's talk about, you know, you just mentioned Mumbai, both of you, and that's that kind of segues nicely into the next question I have, which is about place, setting, as a character. Because, you know, I, I, I grew up in Bombay and I've known you know, I grew up in the Western suburbs, then we moved to the Juhu area. So I did, I lived a pretty middle class life where I didn't go to Dongri and some of these places that you guys have written about. So my introduction to a lot of these places was through fiction, right? And so when I read about these places uh, that are in Mumbai, Bombay, as I knew it, but, you know, I'm reading about it through fiction because I wasn't physically as a, as a middle class woman not allowed to go to those places. And I, I would feel like how vividly, you know, you brought those areas, locations to life on the page. And, and to, so, so I'd like to just ask that question. Talk to me a little bit about how you see place or setting in crime and noir fiction, in your fiction, as yet another character, Bombay as the city 
is another character in your writing? Uh, see, to be honest, in Mumbai, if I'm writing about Mumbai Mafia, I cannot uh, place Mumbai Mafia, say, in Juhu. It will mm, look very course. unreal. Yes, right. And uh, they have to be in their own predominantly uh, locality where they are in majority and where they operate from. Right. Now, uh, South Mumbai is an area where all these guys have got clustered, you know, Daud and Arun Gavli, Karim Lala, Haji Hassan, Chota Shikil. They are into South Mumbai area and especially mm -hmm. in the Muslim ghetto side. And mm -hmm. what they call, you know, these guys, they don't refer to the uh, places. They don't say Paiduni or they don't mm -hmm. say Kalba Devi. Or hmm. they won't even say uh, Memanwala. These guys, when they talk among themselves, they say Bombay number 10, Bombay number 9. That's how they talk hmm. among themselves. So now hmm. if I'm going to be writing about yeah, these places, I have to be well versed with what is Bombay number 10 and what area does it cover? Bombay number 9, hmm. what is there in Bombay number 9? And then what, are the, what is the geography? You will not uh, believe that I, you know, in the first year of my writing, I sat with a huge map of Mumbai and I kind of, you know, memorize the whole setting, the whole topography. Where is Kalba Devi? Okay, this is bullion market. And this Kalba Devi does not have any Muslim pocket at all. It is actually a very stronghold of Gujarati, Jain and those mm -hmm. builders. So uh, uh, businessmen. So now this is totally out. Then this is Dongri. Now Memanwada, Shams Market, JJ Square, this uh, BP Road. I remembered all those areas name. And then even today I have a huge map when I start writing, I want to be very correct in my way so that I don't make mistakes. I am not from Dogri. I have lived all my life in Northern Mumbai, say in Ghatkovar area and Victoria. Mm. I mm. don't want to be mistaken in that. At the same time, I want to portray them accurately, Mumbai Mafia and South Mumbai, so that people cannot pinpoint any kind of factual errors in my storytelling. Yeah. 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 And as, as Hussein was saying, that you know, it, it's not just the geography of, of physical places and buildings. It's a social geography, right? And as you were saying, the person who lives in Juhu and comes out of there is very different from the person who lives elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So in order to get the reader to engage with the character uh, and to for yourself even to understand who that person is, mm -hmm. you have to deal with the physical surroundings, which are also social surroundings, right? Uh, and then uh, Hussein knows this territory like nobody else does, right? And, uh, he was my kind of guide into this entire world. And um, and it's actually, I mean, for me, um, it's fun, right? You, you, you move between these various worlds. And this is the thing that detective and crime fiction has always been able to do because the investigator uh, starts investigating a murder at one corner of the city. Uh, maybe the person who's uh, murdered is poor, right? An outsider. And then through the detective's investigation, through the middle layers, you find out that the murderer is the governor, right? Mm. And, and so you, you get this kind of up, you know, you can move uh, horizontally across the city, but also vertically along the various layers of the culture. And that's great fun to watch and it's great fun to do. Yeah, but it's and complicated. I took, him around, I... I took him around to the dark underbelly of the city, the way we went to Dagri Chal. I mean, you should remember the how Vikram Chandra was sitting there in a in the area where Gauli is lording over his throne and all his people. And we're sitting in a place which seemed to be like more of a mandir or a temple than a dawn's den. And Vikram was sitting very comfortably absorbing the surrounding, maybe for making notes, mental notes, which I didn't see at that time. And then Karim Lala's house, one Pathan's house, very sober kind of thing. We have been to even shady places like Bapu Kote Street, where every third youngster would be carrying a gun under his pocket and we have moved on these places in Mumbai. I don't know whether Vikram remember all those places, but today when I remember, I mean, you know, I just feel that what all we have explored in the city. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. You know, no, I, I think that's fascinating because, you know, as you were just saying, na naming those places, each of the, the individual places you've just named, it has a character of its own, which then adds to the, the person there, you know, if you've, if you've situated a fictional character in a certain setting, you're also adding to the atmosphere and the sense of that character, right? Because their surroundings tell us something about them. So I, I think that's kind of um, interesting. And, and, you know, you mentioned about um, one of the places that you just went to, Hussein, where they, every third young man had a, had a gun, every person, yeah. which reminded me 
of this, you know, well-known story now of how you got kidnapped in Iraq, right? Because yeah, they yeah, wanted yeah. to, yeah, they wanted to meet Amitabh Bachchan or something like that. Yeah, and so I won't go into that particular story, but I'm curious because you're going into, you know, to all these pretty risky places, both of you. Um, do you... Like, do you have a certain process where, you know, you have to have like, uh, you have to tell family and friends where you're going to be and the time and check in with people. Like if somebody, if I was going to start writing crime fiction in Mumbai now, and I wanted to visit some of those places, what precautions, what, what should I be aware of and what precautions would I take? See, what, what uh, advice? Fortunately, I've, my, I've married a woman who I've covered uh, crime herself. So she is also a crime journalist. So that way I didn't have to be cautious about anything. And we all know that dangers, what people see from the other side is different than what we see from inside when covering crime. Uh, as such, I have not taken any precaution whenever I go for these stories because I, I was, I think, invariably sure that I'm going to come back alive, except that Iraq incident where mm -hmm. I didn't know I'll get kidnapped from a busy Baghdad market and they are going to blindfold me and take me to a place and put me across a man. Who, who wants to kill me because he thinks I'm a Snoopy Pakistani trying to find out about him, then I'll report to CIA. So they had this kind of, you know, uh, misunderstanding about me. But when I told them that I'm an Indian journalist, he was very happy. And then he showed me Amisha Bakkan and, yeah. you know, the whole story after that. So uh, except this time, I mean, my wife was aware that where I am and what I'll be doing and when I'm going to come back home. So I don't think I take as such any precaution except by telling my wife that today I'm going in this territory for so and so story. That's it. Hmm. Yeah, no, I never told anyone, especially my mother. <laughs> oh, yeah, she. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at least, I mean, Hussein's, uh, when he goes in to meet somebody, it's a slightly different, a very different like kind of dialogue that happens because I always told everyone I'm a fiction writer, right? And and often they didn't quite actually get that, right? Why are you writing a book? So then I would say, okay, I'm actually researching a movie, right? And then everybody would get very interested and they would have opinions and, you know. Um, so coming up front, you know, I would say to them, I'm, I'm not writing journalism, I'm not doing reporting, I'm just going to write a story, right? So that sets up a different relationship and people are more willing to talk to you, right? You remember um, that Chelsea, because we met at Takinaka, Yes. You're talking to this guy and saying, Kya kar rahe ho? Dusri satya bana rahe ho? You know, yes. and instead of we asking questions from this man, he started asking from Vikram, Dusri satya bana rahe ho? Kya kar rahe ho? And Vikram was looking at him, we are here supposed to ask questions. And he was told, totally zonged. And this man is asking questions, and you should see Vikram was very patiently asking things. You know, satya ban gayi, abhi kuch aur Those kind of things. <laughs> I love that. By the way, that could be the title of a story, The Chersi of Saki Naka. <laughs> that could just be. <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, but I ended up using that a lot, right, in, in the writing because uh, this fascination with cinema, which is a part of Indian culture in general, uh, is also, of course, goes to, um, you know, into the crime world, into the policing world. So, uh, and, and, you know, people had really large opinions about, you know, Satya was accurate, but that other movie, that was bullshit, right? Like, that was mm -hmm. completely a wrong kind of portrayal. And then, you know, uh, Hussein will know about this, but sometimes the big time gangsters take offense, right? Yeah, like yeah. somebody will do a go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you continue. continue. I'll, I'll come with the example yeah, you, later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, you somebody thinks, oh, they made a movie on based on my life and you've yeah. gotten it wrong, right? You showed me as weak yeah. or something like yeah. that, and then yeah. they get pissed yeah. off. Yeah. For example, in those days, there was a movie called Gangster. Which gangster were Shiny Auja, Imran Hashmi, mm. and I think Kangana Rao were playing. So yeah. they showed that uh, the gangster was supposed to be based on Abu Salim's life. Mm. So uh, Abu Salim was very offended because in the end, I think he was shown too desperate and was seen begging on the streets. Abu Salim was very furious about that part. That how can you show me? I mean, okay, I love and I was totally increasingly in love with this girl, but I will not beg on the street. I know how to make money and I, how to remain rich till the end of my life. So those kind of things. They were naming movies and they were getting upset about it. Well, and then I think Arun yeah. had some, some problem about uh, Satya, where he was projected in Satya the way a Hindu dawn was projected. And he said, no, they have totally misrepresented me and my image. So I've been, I've been through this so many times. I can imagine. <laughs> I, can, I mean, I, yeah, it's risky when the people you're writing about are yeah. still living. And even if you're disguising and saying, well, this is a character based on, you still have to try to 
do them justice in the way that they would like to see. Which, which brings me to my next question. When, when we talk about characterization and some of your, a, a number of your characters in the fiction that you've written are, you know, the characters are based on real life, as you've said. Um, but what are, you know, crime and noir fiction sometimes gets uh, accused of uh, perpetuating certain stereotypes, right? Certain caricatures. And, and I know that it can happen. I'm not saying it's happening in your work, but how do you, when you're teaching, when you're teaching students uh, to write, you know, what, do you, what advice do you give on how to avoid, you know, letting your characters become caricatures or stereotypes? What are some ways to avoid doing that? See, I, I have always tried to, you know, tell my students and whom I mentor while in the process of writing and, you know, on crime journalism, that don't get influenced by what you see on the screen. Because what we see on the screen is an exaggerated perception of a director, which is mm -hmm. not based on facts, may not be accurate. For example, you will always see gangsters on the screen. They are mouthing expletives. They are wearing half a kg gold chain in the neck. Now you will not see real these kind of characters. Vikram has met so many of them. He has met Arun Gavli, which looks more like a politician and a neta. Very white, starched, close to the Gandhi camp. He has met Hussein Sheikh Ustra. He was wearing Paco Raban perfume and, you know, very nicely creased pants and shirts of very uh, expensive fabric. Now, with this kind of thing, you know, what happens is it, it is very difficult to know that what is reality and what is fact. But I have been through this for 25 years. I know that what is the fact here and the gangster that is portrayed here is actually a total misrepresentation. So I keep telling my students, don't go by what is on the screen. Meet some of them in real life. Now, for example, uh, I will give an example of Shota Shakil and Daud. They have never used any abuse or expletives with me. Abu Salim, you should see the kind of branded stuff that he wears. Whenever I've met him in the court, he wears branded stuff. And he believed that he's, the, he's more handsome than Salman Khan. It was bad luck that he ended up on this wrong side of the law. Otherwise, he would have a better chance in film industry than Salman has. Now, with this kind of mindset, they are not going to be dressed the way we see them on the screen. You know, this thick gold chain and having pan in their mouth and, you know, mouthing expletives. So my whole thing is that it is very different. And that's what I keep telling my people. Don't follow the stereotype. Don't follow that image that you see on the screen. Make your own conclusion, meet your own people and be very factual and accurate when you write about them. Which is what you'll see in my book as well. Mm -hmm. I don't follow mm -hmm. the stereotype. It is different. Yeah. My gangster will not be wearing a pathani, will not be have a surma. And we'll not have, a, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. No, but as, I mean, and the Hussein Ustra that um, uh, Hussein just spoke about, Hussein the Razor, right? He got that yeah, name in right. young yeah. because he yeah. carried a straight razor um, as his weapon of choice. So when we met him in his house, um, he looked like a stockbroker, right? If you had seen mm -hmm. him on like Nariman Point, you would have thought he was some like guy dealing in big amounts of money. Um, and he then like reaches into his pocket and pulls out a little Beretta, right? Which he carried all the time. Uh, so to me, that's much more interesting as a character, right? As, like as a human being. Um, so I think the effort should be to de uh, depict people in the, all their complexity, right? And I've never met anyone in my life who thinks they're a bad person, right? Everyone has the story in which their narrative of their own history is, I had to do this. Right. Uh, so this whole idea of I'm a bagi, I'm a re rebel against the system. Right. So if you're going to do interesting characters, then um, or interesting nonfiction, you have to get that aspect of people into the pages and make your uh, reader engage with them. Uh, and I find it very disappointing when you have these caricatures who uh, who, are, who are constructed in a way that you can predict every action that they're going to take next. Right? So it's boring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why I like that, you know, your characters in, in your fiction, they have shades of gray and not only the to your point about the complexity, I like that they have contradictions. Mm -hmm. Right. And that that makes them less predictable. Like with Sattaj saying, you've got the contradictions there. So, you know, you, you don't he doesn't like when you expect him to zig, he's going to zag. And that's what keeps you wanting to turn the pages as well. So I think that's really important. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that, that, you know, we need to be be real but keep them complex and nobody thinks they're a bad person so that's yeah that's really important so so you know Hussain you've talked a lot about your journalism which reminded me that both of you have come to to writing your fiction 
from sort of different parts, right? I mean, Vikram, you've got your MFA and, you know, I, I was actually, my introduction to your work was the Bombay stories, mm. um, you know, and be, because I was, as a, as a Bombay person, I was looking for stories, about, short stories, because I love the short story form. I had been looking for short stories about Bombay. I found yours. I found Salman Rushdie's East West and, you know, just a whole bunch. And that was kind of my gateway into your reading your work and then I got into other stuff with uh, Hussein my gateway was reading your nonfiction, as you said you know I loved Mafia Queens of Mumbai because I thought finally we've got women you know being written about <laughs> as complex yeah. well-rounded yeah. people and they're not yeah. these Sati Savitris you know they are women who smarter just, than men smarter than men more dominating right. more calculating manipulative yes yeah, so exactly. And so I was, yeah. so that was my gateway to your work as well. Yeah. And so yeah. you've both approached fiction, uh, different parts. Talk to me, and maybe, you know, talk about each other's approach in that way is how has that your different path shaped your approach to fiction differently? You know, I think you've talked a little bit about it already, but maybe we could focus a bit more. Like, what, what do you think, how, like, if I ask Vikram, how do you think Hussain's work is different from yours because of the fact that it came from a different path and vice versa? So maybe just talk about how your path has shaped your writing for each other. Well, I think as Hussain said, um, his, um, his, his, uh, what he does requires him to have a kind of faithful um, uh, adherence and truthfulness to what actually happened, mm -hmm. right? And for me, that's very partial, right? I, I can, I like to base things against real events, but then I can like weave my fantasies around them, right? And, and shape them. Um, so I actually, I've written very little nonfiction. Geek Sublime was my one attempt. And what was infuriating about that was that I couldn't just tell lies that I'd made up, right? Uh, and I have to keep careful footnotes for everything that I said, you know, I, I had references by the hundreds. Uh, and that was very hard for me uh, because I like the flexibility of fiction. But I think in reference to, I guess, what you would call research method, I think both of us do similar things. I mean, maybe Hussein will not agree in that, you know, I do a lot of like secondary material research and I love going into the field, as it were, and talking to people. Because when you talk to people is when you get surprised, right? Um, and then what I also tell my students is it's frightening how much people want to tell you once they sit down, right? Even strangers, once you start asking them questions, um, you feel like sometimes you have to stop them. Right? Don't tell me this, right? I think Vikram, what you should do doing is that you should try to write. I mean, I've been asking Vikram to write non-fiction since the time we have met. So we has never agreed to my session. He said that he likes the freedom of writing fiction. But I think Vikram now, you know, looking back at your way you did your research, you finished your research in Sacred Games, I think you should devote some time to write, a, you know, your uh, account of research, the way you, you know, went into uh, Dongri area, you went to Park Modia Street, and the way you met all those dons and all those shady people. You know, I took him to Park Modia Street, which is Daud Ibrahim's headquarter in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And when we were walking through that huge, large iron rod gate, I told him, don't look at there. You know, just kind of look here and there. Then look at the place and then again look straight. So I was kept on instruction as if we were encrossed in this chat. Vikram was walking on my right and this was on my left. So that Vikram can have a good view of the place. Now I'm saying that this is how we have done it. So if he writes his account, his fascinating forays into the Mumbai Mafia and the research, his legwork that he has done, I think it will be quite an interesting read for the people. You know, one thing that I found uh, with Vikram is writing is that he, he refused to write nonfiction. He does not want to write nonfiction. At the same time, he would like to be close to reality, as close as he can, so that the product that we get out of his writing is very, very factual, or close to facts as much as he can. So that is one very nice thing. And I must tell you that I've also learned the art of doing research, uh, or rather absorbing details more from Vikram and the way he has absorbed it than I used to. I used to take notes. And as a journalist, you're always, you know, compelled to take down note. Okay, this, this, this. Vikram was not taking notes. He was trying to absorb details in his photographic memory. I have seen Vikram, his face, you know, the color of his face changing when he was, we were there at Karim Lala's house at, uh, you know, Grand Road. And he was just looking at the, the passage, the stairways and the painting. 
and i was saying his face the color at his face drained i thought what is there i mean is there some kind of fear factor that has come on him right now but he was just looking straight and he was trying to do a lot of thing which i could not get at that time so later on i asked vikram what were you doing why did your face turn ash at that moment he said i was absorbing details i was trying to take pictures of those details in my mind now which i was not doing earlier i followed it up later in my writing that then i started taking photographic stuff wherever i'm meeting someone i try to you know you know peer very hard and look very deep and try to take as much detail in my mind as possible of this as despite the journey that i was not doing but i learned from vikram and he was doing his own research so my point is that as he said our work is so similar though i might be writing non fiction but then i have learned a lot of things from vikram which is why this program should have not have been known as gurus of crime it should have been about guru and chela of crime that would have been more apt i love this program <laughs> no no he was my guru in this world guys he always does it he's very generous Yeah. Uh, no it's a, it's a, yeah it's a mutually beneficial um, yeah. you know partnership yes yeah. yeah no i mean but also i guess my obsession with detail was i mean jenny as a writer you know know this right that um the way that you um make something come alive in the reader's head is through specific detail right mm-hmm. so like uh, hemingway carried this to an obsession right that you only uh, you know uh, three fourths of the writing like an iceberg should be under the water and so with one or two specific details you can evoke a whole world right so you're constantly looking for that one thing that you'll see somewhere right uh, i mean the one story that i always remember about this is i was talking to a young cop in the in a police station and he was sitting at his desk and i was asking him my usual questions i had my notebook out and then what i remembered years later and which i actually ended up using in the book was that under the desk he was wearing really expensive nike right and so like this guy who's like you know young he he's handsome he wants to be the you know the sort of dashing hero of the cop films um he spent all his large amount of his money perhaps some of it ill gotten on these very like elaborate technologically advanced shoes right mm. uh, so that when you pick up that you know that's happy making you like you get as a writer you say ah okay i've got him this is it Yeah I mean those are little details but they go towards building up this complex you know uh, image in in you know part of, become part of the story so yeah I think that's a great one I would have noticed that too yeah it would have been like oh so yes more than that cop who you met with an apple he was mm-hmm. using a mac and the guy can't write two lines of english if he wants to write a leave application but he was having very expensive computer sitting on his table just to flaunt that he's so net savvy and he's so tech savvy yeah. like that kind of things we have seen yeah Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So so talking then, you know, I know we've got a few more minutes left, but I know both of you are involved in various uh initiatives, you know, Hussein especially your your and I need to look up uh, look up the names as the Golden Pen Initiative, there's the Blue, I forget the Blue something, oh, sorry, but yeah. yeah, that's yeah. it, right. And so you both that's of you Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's wait, what is it? The golden pen is with West, and blue salt is with Go- Penguin Random yeah, House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then both both of you have the Writers Room Initiative, and yeah. and you know, and then Vikram, you've got Granthika, which is the software that I definitely want to try out. So so you're doing a lot of what what I, what what we call here in the U.S. obviously literary citizenship, where you're encouraging and helping the next generation of crime and noir writers. Talk to me a little bit about what. got you headed in that way was it just something organically that happened or you made a co- concerted effort and said this is something i want to do you know encourage the next generation talk a little bit about how all of that has come together well um so as far as the the uh, writers room the talking about writers craft uh, husain and i have wanted to do this for decades you know we've been mm-hmm. talking about it for a very very long time um but then i mean there were two problems one is that i moved back and forth between the us and india so you know coordinating time the other is like trying to find a physical space in bombay <laughs> to actually do this was another whole epic right uh, and we didn't want to do it in somebody's drawing room because that falls apart inevitably so then recently especially after the lockdown um, the entire world has gotten <laughs> used to doing things remotely as as we are doing now so we thought this was a good time to actually like you know uh, make it happen and so that's what the writers room is about um and then uh which is i guess i should explain more it's a a, a series of webinars in which we'll talk about various aspects of writing fiction and non fiction 
And then my software is uh, that problem that I was talking about, about keeping track of time, mm -hmm. right? In fiction or in nonfiction, keeping track of all your research. That's always been infuriating to me, right? So if I'm writing in a traditional word processor like Word, and I want to look up that cop who I've interviewed five years ago and look at what I wrote down about him, I have to spend half an hour in my note keeping program to find that, you know, that specific note. So what Granthika does is uh, one way to think about it is that it's a word processor, which is integrated or married with a timeline, with a database. So you can keep all your character information, all your information about locations, your whole timeline in the program. Um, and then you can jump between all of these elements with one keystroke, right? So you don't waste time doing bookkeeping, you write. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's what it is. So so just to get a little nerdy about that, is it is there like a, a relational database sitting underneath the word processor? Uh, I could go on for hours about this, but no, actually, <laughs> because it's it's uh, a traditional database is not flexible enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, with for this kind of stuff, so it's actually uh, uh, knowledge base, mm -hmm. right? Using uh, it's built all of it is built over ontologies, um, so we can reason over whatever the facts we put in, right? So mm -hmm. and it's easily flexible. We can add aspects to you know. Uh, any of these elements, right? Like uh, for sci-fi writers, you know, the two gender model, obviously even in our world doesn't work, right? Because you have non-binary people and all of that. So, but we yeah. can adapt very quickly for all of that. Cool. Well, I'm going to definitely try it out because I'm, I've got a work in process novel and I just want to use something to help me along with that. So that, that'd be great. Thank you. And, and then Hussain, you were going to talk about, you know, the, the different initiatives you're also involved in with Blue Salt and so Golden Blue Pen. Salt actually uh, is, is a more of an imprint uh, with the uh, Penguin Random House. What happened was that uh, for me, um, I know that a lot of people go through, uh, you know, immense struggle to become an author and that too with a big publishing house like Penguin. For me, uh, this journey was made much simpler and, uh, you know, quicker by Mr. Vikram, the great Chandra. While I was helping him in Sacred Games, he said, why would I write a book? And I said, I, I am only a journalist who can write 600 words story a daily. I can't write a book. So he, he, how he mentored me and how he taught me the fine art of writing book. And that too, such a difficult thing like uh, March 12, 1993, uh, the, which was the biggest terrorist act at that time in the world. So I kind of started writing the book and I took four years to write. So after finishing that book, I realized, realized that there are so many people and so many things that needs to be written, but I can only do, you know, so much. Here, uh, then we thought that Vikram told me, why don't I, you know, do some handholdings with some people and mentor them and teach them the art of, you know, writing books. And that's how this uh, imprint Blue Salt was born. And then I started talking to people. Now you will know that Neeraj Pandey, the famous filmmaker, has debuted with this imprint. Bilal mm -hmm. Siddiqui, who's Bard of Blood and, you know, yeah. now on Netflix. So it's, and then former police commissioner Neeraj Kumar. All these guys are, you know, big names. They have done quite good in their own calling, but they have not written a book. It was because of Blue Salt that these guys started writing. So far, we have got 20 such published authors and wow. we have sold a uh, lot of books and some of them have also been converted to movies and series. So this is what we do with Blue Salt. Now, Golden Pen is a different thing. It's more of a production house where we convert content into digital thing. We acquire mm. content of our own authors, our own writers, and then it is, mm. you know, adapted on the screen. There are for a digital web series or for a movie for the big screen. And we have mm. partnered with very big people like Matchbox who have made Andhadun and, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And such are our partners in Golden Pen. So these are two different initiatives, but having more or similar same kind of mm. purpose. Well, no, that's great. And um, yeah, as I said, I attended that one Facebook session and I thought not only did you have like hundreds, I think more than a hundred people that attended almost 150 or so, but I thought that, you know, the interaction back and forth between you and Vikram was very helpful as well because you kept it casual. I loved how you were mixing Hindi and English in the conversation as well because, I mean, that's how people talk. That's how we talk, right? So yeah, that was great. Um, so we're coming to a, almost the end of the session now. I, I just, um, I got the two minute warning there. So I want to thank you both. This was definitely a, a, a lovely conversation for me to just kind of pick your brains on, you know, place and time and plot and character and research. And so this was very helpful. And I, I'm sure the audience uh, who watches this when this airs will find it useful as well. And we've got Kritika back. So 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hussain. Thank you, Vikram, Thank for you, giving Dina. us Thank you, Jenny. insight into your writing and research process. It was very interesting and for sharing these wonderful anecdotes with us. Thank you, Jenny, for steering the conversation so beautifully. And thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Once again, we'd like to thank all our official partners for their support towards the festival. We hope you all enjoyed these conversations and we'll log back on for our next session, Writing the Body, Writing the Land. Riya Mukherjee and David Heska in conversation with Arsen Kashkashian. This will be at 8 p.m. MST, which is 8.30 a.m. IST. We now present a short reading from JLF Writers' short series by Jilam Chatterj. <laughs> Hi everyone, I am Jhelum. I am an academic and poet based in Hyderabad, India. And uh, today I'll be reading for you my poem which is inspired by the tribes of the Andaman Islands and uh, how they use their indigenous wisdom to save themselves from the tsunami and how they reacted when the media found out that they were alive. Please forgive the background noise. My house is uh, located just adjacent to a very busy road, so pardon me, but I hope my reading will compensate. The name of the poem is, I will fall sick if you photograph me. Here we go. 26 December 2004, infinite decay at the shores of the Andamans. Rumor of apocalypse on streets heavy with the marrow of civilization. Caught in times suck and blow. Bones on boats, on trees, on windows, on the collapsed lips of the earth. Except them. They who gathered the mist of moonfall, care to speak to the bridal turtle mapped the gloomy haze over hushed waterways, released tremulous bird calls from their palms. They rose at the edge of the deluge, soon to the wild beats of the dawn, and bribed no expensive gods to break into a blossom. Then came the sentinels of culture to write on the stunned tongues of technology. The tribes are alive, a triumphant answer to man's search for man. But to the lust of their lenses, said the finite forest child, I will fall sick if you photograph me. He did not wish to become a shadow in the wind or the last wave in the age of rising seas. With a bow and arrow on his ash-smeared shoulders, he departed. One last sea lion gaze at the mossy black of the night. Slow and humming into the woody hollows, perhaps a prayer for rain, for everyone to drink a little, for everyone to bathe a little. Thank you. I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living 
library or perhaps even a library of life to join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science of the joys of poetry and music the consolations of philosophy the sense of literature and of life about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics, it's meaningful. I'm just excited, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF co coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. In Work Arts, bringing India to the world and the world to India through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. 
The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavor by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities, featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the Multi-City Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information Visit www.teamworkarts.com